All right, I'm kind of privileged to be with you once again here on Wednesday night I'm from Solid Rock Baptist Church. And I want to let all our folks know that we're praying for you, thinking about you during these times, and I remind you to pray one for another. Uh, we love you and we appreciate you. We ask that you continue to uh, support the ministry and missions as well. You can send your tithes and offerings to um, Solid Rock Baptist Church, P.O. Box 7333, the Outerville, Mississippi 39540. And uh, we uh, want to continue to help those uh, around us who need help, things brought to them, these kinds of things, as I've been keeping in contact with you about. Uh, first of all tonight, uh, of course tonight's our Wednesday night uh, Bible study, and uh, we're going to uh, continue that study. I think it uh, is even appropriate in these times. I do want to say something uh, about uh, um, also another passage before we get into our Bible study, though. And I want to share that with you right now, if I could. And then we'll get into our Bible study here momentarily. If you would, go ahead and, and grab your Bibles, and uh, let's uh, take the time to look into the Word of God and take the time to see what uh, thus saith the Lord. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 13 and 14, I won't stay too long on this, but I do want to encourage you tonight uh, to follow uh, what the Bible tells us here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. The Bible says, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. You say, what's pestilence? Well, pestilence is plague or contagious disease, uh, noxious to health and life. He says, if I send these things among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So I encourage you, people of God, to humble yourselves before the Lord, to pray, to seek the face of God, to turn from your sins. And God made us a promise. He'll forgive us our sins and he'll heal our land. May God send revival to our land. We need it. My soul, do we ever need it? It seems that God is trying to get our attention and uh, we need to be still and know that He is God, almost as if He's put the pause button on everything almost around us and uh, has given us a moment to pause and consider, to think, and uh, to give the God of heaven glory and honor, which is due unto His name. Uh, you know that uh, I'm not a, a great singer by any means, but uh, the Lord sometimes lays songs upon my heart. And I want to uh, sing to you here tonight, saying to the Lord, uh, but encourage you through the song here tonight that the Lord has laid upon my heart. This has been on my heart today, and uh, it's uh, been a blessing to me. I hope it is a blessing to you. It's called Somebody's Prayer. Somebody's praying, I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Lord, I Over me, there's many 
crying for me. Somebody's praying. I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Somebody's praying for me. Amen. I believe somebody's praying. I'm praying for you. I trust that you're praying for me. And I can feel those prayers. And I appreciate those prayers. We need to pray. Mightily, fervently pray. And I thank God that uh, the... Effectual, fervent prayer, a righteous man availeth much. So may we pray in these times. Pray for our leaders. Let's pray for our president, our local leaders, our state leaders, all these who are making decisions uh, and making decisions for us at this time. Uh, health experts, all that are working on all this, all that's going on. All these who have lost jobs because of it, all kinds of things happening, taking place. Uh, I'm telling you, every day uh, the thing is changing. Uh, all kinds of things going on around us. But uh, we know that this is temporary. And I want to say to you tonight, this too shall pass. And uh, it's going to come to pass. And so, my dear friend, we will be back uh, together once again. And uh, I do believe in a not so distant future. Uh, I want you to take your Bibles tonight, if you would. We've been studying knowing who you are and whose you are. And we've been studying particularly in this series uh, recently, The Flesh. And we had started and began to study about Amalek. And Amalek is a type of the flesh. You find in the Word of God, as uh, the children of Israel came out of Egypt, God delivered them out of Egypt, Egypt being a type of the world, and delivered them out of the hand of Pharaoh, Pharaoh being a type of Satan. They went off into the wilderness there. They crossed the Red Sea, and God brought them across on dry land and uh, has uh, taken and destroyed the armies of Egypt who pursued them. And God brought them out with a high hand. Praise God. He is able to do such. And I thank God that... Uh, the Lord is uh, able uh, tonight. Uh, his arm is not short. As I got a text today. Thank you for that. God's arm still is not short. Amen. That it cannot save. It's able to reach down and to do and, uh, and uh, to take care of and to change the things in our lives. But they uh, was going out here through the wilderness as they began their journey there. And uh, they met Amalek. And I should say they may, but rather Amalek came upon them intentionally, uh, without reason or cause. And uh, we'll get a little more in depth into that uh, later on in the Bible study. But uh, we find that Amalek came, and he came upon uh, the children of Israel. And uh, we know that uh, our flesh is a great enemy, a grave enemy. And uh, we know that uh, that that is in us uh, dwelleth no good thing. Uh, the arm of flesh will fail you every time. I thank God that his arm never fails us though. And so uh, we ought to take and no doubt crucify our flesh each and every day. We ought to maybe examine uh, if we're living to the flesh or living to God in these times especially. Uh, we have to always examine that, always keep the mindfulness of this. But in this time, especially as we uh, are paused and as uh, we are uh, in our homes, a lot of us, uh, myself, uh, uh, still having to work. Matter of fact, even more maybe, as they say, uh, they claiming around here at least and probably all over the country that uh, air conditioning is still essential. Uh, well, uh, there was a time people didn't live with air conditioning, but uh, nonetheless, uh, today we think we've got to have it. Uh, but uh, that's uh, none, uh, nonetheless uh, needless to say but a lot of people are confined to their homes uh, they uh, aren't getting out except to get uh, the things that they have necessity of or need of and it's a good time to examine ourselves it's a good time to 
call upon the Lord and to seek His face. And I do believe that God wants us to seek His face. That God is trying to bring us near unto Himself. And the Lord tells us that we'll draw nigh unto Him. Well, He draw nigh. He will draw nigh unto us. And so uh, the ball is in our court. And I no doubt that God wants to have control. He is Lord. He is upon the throne. I wonder if He's on the throne of your heart tonight. And so as we look into this uh, Word of God, the perfect law of liberty, we look here in the Word of God to see some things that God has to say to us tonight. Uh, last uh, couple of, uh, well, last week, last Wednesday night, we looked at this concerning Amalek, concerning the flesh, uh, verses number 1 through 4 we read there, and I won't read it again, but I do want to uh, mention to you that we've seen in verses number 1 through 4 that they was unthankful and they was discontent. And this unthankfulness and this discontent in their lives uh, brought about a, a mighty battle with the flesh. And we looked at Colossians 3, 1 through 17, again in Hebrews 13, verses number 5 and 6. So we see that this discontentment, this unthankfulness, and we see that same thing today, yet we look around us and uh, at a time like this, uh, when uh, everything has come to pass, when we do get back uh, to some normal scene, uh, we're going to find that uh, we are very thankful for some things that we have taken for granted, or at least I hope we do. And uh, we're going to, uh, we see that uh, the things that uh, uh, we don't have, that we're discontented uh, with, that really they're not as important as we thought they was. We find that there are some things that we ought to be content with. Godliness with contentment is great gain, the Bible tells us. And so we ought to be content with the things that we have, such things as we have. Uh, the Bible tells us to be content with, with food and with raiment, and we still have these provisions, and thank God for them. And we ought to be contented in that which we have. And so yet when we are discontent and unthankful, we begin to fight a battle with the flesh. The flesh comes upon us and begins to distract us and begins to attack us and begins to try to keep us from some things that God wants us to have in our lives. Uh, some spiritual things, some godly things, some things that will bring glory and honor unto His name. So we seen that there last week. We want to look at verses number 5 and 6 tonight. If you look there with me in uh, this uh, passage in Exodus, Exodus chapter there, number 17, Exodus chapter 17. As we look at Exodus chapter 17 in the Word of God tonight. And uh, let me get over there with you. Exodus chapter 17, verses number 5 and 6. Exodus 17, verses 5 and 6. We see here as the children of Israel are in the wilderness now, the Bible says in verse 5 and 6, The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee of all the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come uh, come water out of it that the people may drink and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Let's pray for a moment tonight, shall we? Lord Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and we thank you now, Lord, for all that you've given us. We thank you, Lord Heavenly Father, for the household of faith. We ask you now, God, that you touch us. Help us, Lord, in this time. May we build up most holy faith. May we be strengthened in the Lord. May the power of thy might rest upon us. And may we teach tonight in demonstration the power of the Holy Spirit. Touch the needs now, Lord God, around us. Help us now, Lord, in this time. Lord, we look unto thee. We know from whence cometh our help. Lord, the help of me is vain, but God tonight, your help is complete and full and perfect and able. And I ask you tonight, God, that you'd bring a Lord rest to the souls of your people. I pray there be comfort and peace tonight, the peace that passes all understanding. I ask you tonight, God, that you give us courage and strength for the day of adversity. I pray, Lord God, tonight that you'd help us, Lord God, to gather our families together. Lord, to love them, to care for them, to encourage them, and Lord, to pray with them, and Lord, to re 
to the Bible with them and to study with them and to call upon you with them, O Lord God, tonight. I pray, Lord, Heavenly Father, you touch our world. It's in chaos. Lord, all kinds of things are going on around us. They're out of our control. We have no control over them tonight. But we know the one who is in control. And we look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. We look to you, our strength and our shield and our comforter and our refuge tonight. We look to you, Lord, for guidance. We look to you for wisdom. We look to you for knowledge and power, God, tonight. We look to you to overcome, for thou hast overcome, and we too are overcomers in thee tonight. I ask you now, Lord, Heavenly Father, we might be reminded that nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remind us that we have a sure and steadfast hope, that we have tonight, Lord, a steadfast faith. Lord, tonight we have, Lord, a more excellent weight of glory. And I ask you tonight, Lord, that you'd help us to reach the lost and the dying. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be bold, to speak the truth in love. And I ask you tonight, Lord, that you'd help us to help those who are in need around us. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to help the elderly and the sickly and those who have weakened immune systems. And, Lord, Heavenly Father, our neighbors, I pray, Lord God, to be mindful of others. We would not be stingy heady or high-minded in one way or the other. But Lord Heavenly Father tonight that we would care for those who are around us. Help us Lord God to be the church in these trying times and help us Lord God to look Lord to and at ourselves and see Lord God number one whether or not we be in the faith but number two that we might see to ourselves that we are maintaining good works that we are maintaining the things, Lord, that you have given us. That we are maintaining our relationship, all most important, with you. We ask you these things and ask your blessings upon this time tonight. In Jesus' name and for his glory, touch us now, Lord, by thy power and by thy might. We know that, that thou art the great provider of all things. And we trust in you and we have confidence in you and in your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look here at the word of God, we look at the thought here of Amalek, and we look at how in verses number 5 and 6, he begins to tell us about uh, some things that are taking place. And so we see in verse number 5, the Bible says, The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, who with thou smotest the river, Take in thine hand and go. And we'll be looking at that a little bit later on in the lesson. Not tonight, but another night. And he says, Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb. I'm glad the Lord will stand before us. He says, And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So we see in verses 1 through 4, their unthankfulness, their discontentment. They was chiding with Moses. They was murmuring. They was complaining. This is a sin, by the way. But they was doing these things. And my dear friend, uh, we find here a little later, we'll look into it later, but verse number 8, then came Amalek and fought with Israel, ripping them. And so uh, because of some of the things that was taking place here, we find that they are attacked. And I'm looking at this in the way of the flesh attacking you and I. And so unthankfulness. This contentment brings about an attack of our flesh, great temptations, and my dear friend, sins. And when sin is conceived, it brings forth death. And so when that sin is conceived, it brings forth this, this wickedness and this sin, and therefore it brings forth death. And so we find here in verse 5 and 6, so something wonderful happens. In the midst of their unthankfulness, in the midst of their discontentment, I'm going to say despite it tonight, that God does something for the children of Israel. They have a need. Their need is water. It's a central need for every one of us. We cannot live very long without water. And we know we need it. So the Lord does something for them. He gives them water in the wilderness. Moses takes the rod and he smites the rock. And out of the rock, God told him and promised him, he said, there shall come water. There's going to come water out of this rock. And so God does this 
that's for the children of Israel. God gives them water because they have a need. And he doesn't despite their unthankfulness and their discontentment. Now, something lies deeper here than the physical need of water. Something more is going on here. God is painting a picture. Uh, he has given us a foreshadow of something. And he's trying to tell us of something that is to come. And how much God loves us and cares for us despite our discontentment. Despite our unthankfulness. Despite our lack of gratitude. Despite, my dear friend, us not raising our hands to the God of heaven who, by the way, is worthy tonight to be praised and honored uh, no matter the circumstances that we are going through. These people did not choose, though, to be thankful to God. They did not choose to praise the Lord. They did not choose to have gratitude and thanksgiving to the God of heaven. But rather, they chose unthankfulness and discontentment. Yet despite that, the Lord brings them water in the wilderness from the rock. Now this rock, my dear friend, that followed the children of Israel is spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Turn over there with me if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 1. We find here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1 where the Bible says this. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Let's talk about that manna. And by the way, all these things are foreshadows. All these things are types and pictures of things that God was doing and was going to do. And so we find here, of course, that uh, he said and did all drink the same spiritual rock. And this is our emphasis here in this passage. He said, for they drank of that spiritual rock. And if you'll notice there, the word rock, uh, they, uh, as he says it there, where I just read it, is capitalized. That followed them. He said, this rock followed them. And so he's not talking about the rock up there on Horeb that Moses smote. That was a literal physical rock, by the way. God brought down strange rivers of water that they could drink, that they could live in the wilderness. And no doubt there was a great blessing to them. And uh, despite what they'd done, God was merciful and He was caring and He was loving and He met the needs of His people. When we find here this rock that followed them, the Bible says, and that rock, and identifies it, was Christ. So the Bible tells us that the rock that was following them, uh, that was Christ. And so this rock, it says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent. What's the intent? What's your intentions, Lord? We should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now, I'm just going to stop just for a minute. I'm going to continue to read here just a moment. But let me get back on this for a second. That rock, that rock was Christ. So my dear friend, our rock, the rock in which God has built His church. Upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We might already claim that right now. Amen. But the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who was that rock? That rock was Jesus Christ. And so my dear friend, that rock out of it came forth living water. When Jesus Christ died on Calvary and he was smitten by God, my dear friend, on Calvary for our saints, for our sins, Jesus Christ Hey, it issued a precious flow, the flow of his precious blood, that we might be cleansed and saved that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, my dear friend, the precious waters, the waters of life in this wilderness of this world came forth on Calvary's cross. And my dear friend, that crimson flow would wash us and does and has, if you're a child of God, washed us white as snow. And if you're not a child of God tonight, that precious blood can wash and cleanse all your sins. Make you whole. Make you clean. My dear 
dear friend, make you a child of God. Hey, the Lord Jesus came into his own, but his own received him not. But as many as would receive him, have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior tonight? As many as would receive him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God. And so I'm a child of the King tonight. I'm not a child of the King tonight because I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm not a child of the king tonight because I, I go and do good things for people, good deeds. I'm not a child of the king tonight because my good outweighs my bad. I'm a child of the king tonight because he has given me power through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because I put my faith and confidence and trust in him and him alone. I hope you've done that. Uh, my dear friend, tonight, if you have it, you can and you should. And my dear friend, tonight, you uh, would be saved by the grace of God if you would only come to Him. And so we find here in the Word of God, this living water came out. Thank God for the living water. And he goes on to say this. He told us it was our example. Of course, we're looking at the flesh. This is what the lesson is about. It's our example of what? That we, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. In other words, walk in the lust of our flesh, our carnality, and that which is contrary to God and contrary to the new nature that God has given us. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Behold, all old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so I thank God that He has uh, uh, brought me up out of that miry clay. He set my feet on a solid rock. That's Jesus Christ. He's established my goings. Uh, he's given me the Word of God to establish these things. The path of my feet. He's established my goings. And my dear friend has put a new song in my heart. Even praise unto my God. I'm glad those old songs aren't in my heart anymore. But the new songs are in my heart. Those songs that bring praise and glory unto God. And verse number 7, he said, Neither be ye adulterers, as were some of them. As is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We know our land is filled with idolatry today. It is filled with idolatry that we have put things before God. God wants to be number one. And God wants to be in control. And God wants to be in control of your life tonight. And he is in control, by the way, in the throne of heaven. You making him Lord, or you acknowledging that him as Lord doesn't make him Lord. He's already Lord, but you need to acknowledge him as such in your life. You need to let him have control. My dear friend, our world, uh, not only in the church, but also in government, needs to go back to the authority of the Word of God and let him have control. God has set the standard, and we are to conform to His standard. Not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So He says, now let uh, us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day. Three and twenty thousand, that's twenty-three thousand people in a day, fell dead. You think the coronavirus is dead, me? But he says, Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and was destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them as in samples and they are written for our admonition. I'm going to tell you what, it's a pattern to show us by example. He says, Un upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We better take heed uh, to the word of God. We better take heed uh, to the scripture. He says in verse 13, There had no temptation taken you. We're talking about the flesh tonight. You're talking about sin. You say, preacher, I can't seem to get any victory over sin. We're already more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. We already have the victory. Christ has won it. But faith is the victory. We, our reliance must be upon the Lord. He said, there had no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. Preacher, you don't know how much I'm tempted. You don't know all the things 
that my flesh does not. You don't know how many things are put in front of me every day. Well, the Lord told us you're not tempted, my dear friend, uh, but with a common temptation. It's common to man. What you're going through is common. We are in the flesh as far as physically, bodily, yet we do not live under the flesh. We're no longer the flesh. We're crucified with Christ. We're risen. Yea, risen with Him under newness of life. And I thank God for that. And that's a wonderful truth. But my dear friend, that temptation you're suffering is common to man. But God, notice what he said, but God is faithful. Anytime you see that book, you better pay attention. You better open your eyes. You better listen with your ears. Having ears to hear, you better hear tonight. With eyes to see, you better see. Let God open your eyes. He said, but with the temptation, he tells them, but brother, but God is faithful. So it's not about you, it's about God. You have a common temptation, but God is faithful. Who's going to deliver you? It's God. He's faithful. You must put your trust in Him. You must follow Him. You must be obedient to His Word. You must crucify this flesh and live unto Christ. Put you on the new man. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ to make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. He said here, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. And here's a promise. God says He knows how much you're able to bear when it comes to temptation. He says he'll not suffer you. In other words, he'll not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. So he's not going to allow you to be tempted above that which you're able. In other words, God's faithful. He's going to take care of it. And he's not going to allow the tempter. And that's who tempts you, by the way. God doesn't tempt you, but the tempter, Satan does. He's not going to allow the tempter to tempt you above that which you are able to be delivered from. Well, notice what he says. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that she may be able to bear it. So he tells us, look, God is going to make a way of escape in your temptation. You are to take the way out. Now, you're not to put yourself in positions of temptation. That's some people's problems. They put themselves in positions of temptation. I was talking to a lady at Sounds the other day, and uh, uh, me and my wife, was talking to her. Uh, we asked her if she was online. She was kind of there close to the checkout. Uh, she was, I guess, just going through some things and she saw, no, y'all's all right. And uh, uh, we was talking and uh, uh, we was talking about, got to talk about the Lord and she said, uh, the Lord's got this. And uh, she said, uh, uh, I, I, I'm just thankful that the Lord shut the casinos down because she said I was going too much. Now look, I want to say to you, hey, thank the Lord, hey, amen, this casino shut down. I thank God the bars and nightclubs are shut down. And uh, it's all given us a pause. And even uh, many of these sins uh, that are out there in the world, temptations have been shut down. But I thank God for that, no doubt. But I want to say to you that God doesn't have to shut down the casino, nor the bar, or any of these other types of things in order for you to resist Temptation. Some people, my dear friend, put themselves in temptation's way. And y'all not do that. But times, there's times you run into temptation. You're not trying to be in the midst of it. You're not trying to be in the way of it. But, but it comes along and you run into temptation. But God says at this time, I'm going to make a way to escape you. I'm going to make a way out. You don't have to succeed to the temptation. But rather, you can escape it. Through me, I've made a way. I thank God. This book, hey, what a way of escape to temptation. This whole book, my dear friend, that God has given us, the Word of God. This uh, book, my dear friend, helps us and gives us a path, a light unto our feet, a, a lamp unto our feet, and a light unto our path tonight. And so thank God for this great way of escape. I thank, you, I thank God for that here tonight. And so, we would look at this here and we see that God brought forth water despite the things. Now, we're looking back in Exodus chapter uh, number uh, 17 with you one more time here again. And I want you to look here at verse number 7. We're going to close with this thought tonight. We've got a few things here I want you to see on it as we wrap up this thought here tonight. And we'll get uh, to this Lord, uh, this uh, rest of the Lord willing uh, here uh, this coming week. But we find in verse number 7 where the Bible says this. He says, and he called the name of the place Mishia and Mirabah. 
because of the chiding of the children of Israel. Those places, words mean strife. It was a place of strife. And so my dear brother, murmuring, unfaithfulness, discontentment, this brings about strife. And we know this. And God doesn't want us to strive against one another. And we ought to strive against sin. We ought to strive against the things of the world. And we ought to strive against the devil. But my dear friend, we ought not to strive one against another. And we ought not have this discord among the brethren. But there was a place of strife. And they were striving against the man of God. And they were striving against the word of God. And they were striving against God himself. This is what it all boils down to. But the Bible tells us here, at this place, he says, because of the child and the children of Israel, that's why he called these names, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now, don't you notice that? They asked the question. They questioned God. Is the Lord among us or not? They're questioning here the presence of God. They're questioning whether or not God is there. And some uh, of you listening tonight may have even asked that question in a time like this. Is God here? Does God even care? Is His presence anywhere? Let me say to you, the Lord is all night present tonight. He is everywhere. And if you're a child of God tonight, you have a promise. I'll never, never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And you can be sure that God was there, and God is here tonight. And I'm thankful for the presence of God. And I pray that you run to the presence of God, and come to the presence of God, and come near unto Him. No doubt He desired, this is His desire, to bring us unto Himself. And so He's no doubt going to use the circumstances to help bring us unto Himself. And yes, the enemy has tried to send out a bombardment upon us. But I say unto you, my dear friend and I, that God wants to work good in this situation. And if you'll come to God, and you'll come near to God and let Him, He'll bring good out of it. And there'll be many things that He's going to bring. I have no doubt in my mind, good from this situation. And if it's you coming and drawing near to God, that would be one good thing that would come out of it. If you come to Jesus Christ, if you're lost, that'd be a good thing that would come out of it. And there are many good things that no doubt God wants to bring out of the situation. But we find here that they had something, my dear friend, that is astronomical. A worse thing than Amalek is about to come off this hill and it no doubt is a part of what brings it into our lives this battle. But my dear friend, we find here they ask God and question God and tempted the Lord and said, is the Lord among us or not? They had something we call the Bible. The Bible describes as unbelief. My dear friend, they had a wicked seed of sin in their hearts that was coming out and they're murmuring and they're complaining and they're unthankfulness. It was unbelief. They did not trust and believe God. They did not take God at His word. They did not put their confidence in the Lord. My dear friend, they had their confidence in other things so much so that they wanted to go back to Egypt in a place where they were slaves. They were uh, servants of Pharaoh. They were slaves and servants of Egypt. They'd done the bidding of Egypt and they built the things in Egypt. And my dear friend, they was mistreated. My dear friend, they was uh, 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 treated uh, bad and uh, uh, they was uh, dying because of uh, their uh, heavy task and their taskmasters and all that they had and very little that they had there in God and brought them out of the mighty and strong hand. And yet they still did not believe. They still did not trust the Lord and this got them into some severe trouble. We know Amalek came right after their unbelief. And Amalek came to do battle. I'm going to tell you, if Satan can get you to question God, if he can get you to question His Word, God's Word, then my dear friend, and you'll get that unbelief to come in. And you will have a oh, uh, battle like you've never known with your flesh because of unbelief. 
Well, if faith is the victory, then well, obviously, this unbelief is where our failures come from. This unbelief is uh, where we are defeated. This unbelief is where uh, we allow our temptations to become sin and allow that sin to uh, work in us. This, un uh, uh, this lust and this unholiness and this covetousness and, and, and this unbelief begins to create havoc in our lives. I want to share with you two places in Hebrews. You turn over there in Hebrews chapter 3 tonight and chapter 3 and chapter 4 and we're going to close with these thoughts but we see here that this unbelief uh, was taking place in their lives and it was creating problems and difficulties in their lives. Amalek was about to come and fight them in this weak hour, in this hour of unbelief, in this hour of unthankfulness, this hour of discontentment, this hour of murmuring, complaining. Amalek was about to come and to fight with them. And so we find here this unbelief. Uh, my dear friend leads us to battles with the flesh. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 6 we read this. The Bible tells us, he says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end, wherefore as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice. Are you listening to what God is trying to say to us in these times? Are you listening for the voice of God? What is God trying to say to you, my dear brother or my dear sister? What is God trying to say to you, sir or ma'am? What is God trying to say and what is He trying to do in our lives? He says, harden not your hearts as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness. So these people were hardening their hearts against God. The more God tried to deal with them, the more the circumstances put pressure on them. Instead of turning to God, instead of running to the Lord, instead of seeking His face, instead of turning from their wicked ways, these people, my dear friend, hardened their heart against God. They blamed God. They questioned God. They murmured toward God. They were unthankful toward God. So my dear friend, let it not be said of us that in these times that we are going through that we harden our hearts against God. May our hearts be softer now than ever. And may we have an ear attentively listening to what God has to say to us in these times. He said, harden not your hearts in the provocation of the day of temptation of the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works forty years. If you remember, they was going to go to the promised land and eventually they did, but these who uh, had unbelief were not able to enter in because of that unbelief and they died in the wilderness over this 40 year span. They roamed in circles in the wilderness. God worked miraculous things then. He took care of them. He gave them man to eat. He gave them water to drink. Uh, he uh, uh, made their shoes when they didn't rot off. Their clothes didn't rot off. They wasn't moth eaten. Uh, they were able to, uh, to go out throughout this wilderness in these times despite what they had done. God provided for them miraculous ways, but they never was able to enter in. Those who did not believe were not able to enter into the promised land because of this unbelief. He says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart. Oh, they draw nigh to me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. Their hearts not be far from God. They be near him, and they have not known my ways, he said. They didn't know my ways. They didn't care about what thus saith the Lord. They didn't care about the ways of God, the Bible, the Word of God. We better get back to the Bible. My dear friend, we're going to wind up back in the jungle if we don't get back to the Bible. we got to get back to the precepts of God, the Word of God, the things of God. And we ought to, uh, my dear friend, look to God today and say, Lord, what would you say? What are you trying to show me? God, give me the way. I want the old paths. I want to walk in the good way that you have given us and shown us. Verse 11, he said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. So we see here that this land of Canaan was a place of rest. And my dear friend, we look at this, and we look at this, and this, this, this battle of the flesh, the fact is we can have victory. And God wants us to have rest. I believe Canaan... 
uh, is a type of the victorious Christian life. A lot of people talk about being the type of heaven, but there's still war and stuff going on in Cain, and they're fighting battles, but the battle is the Lord, and the Lord's fighting the battles for them. So really this Cain and land, I ain't nothing wrong with singing a song about it, and about heaven and all that, and the relation to that, but really it is more of a type uh, of this victorious Christian life. And so uh, it's a place of rest. Uh, she said they shall enter in uh, into my rest. He said, I swore my wrath. They're not going to enter in because of this unbelief. Your unbelief is what is keeping you from a victorious Christian life. First and foremost, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. He's talking to your brethren. He said, take heed, brethren. These are people that are saved, born again, children of God. Now, obviously, uh, the sin of unbelief is, is the, uh, the most awful sin there is. It is the worst, the wickedest sin of all, the sin of unbelief. And people are going to die and go to hell because they've not put their trust and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's talking about even after we're saved, the Bible says we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And so if we look around us, we're troubled. We look over the left, we look over the right, we look what's going on here in our country, we look at what's going on in China, we look at what's going on in South Korea, we look at what's going on in Europe and, and in Spain and Italy and all these places, and we look around and we're troubled by that if we look at that. And we look at that and we're not got our eyes on God, then we're troubled, we're bothered, and we look behind us at our past and we see our failures and our faults and, and all the things that we've done contrary to God. Once again, troubled. My dear friend, if we'll put our eyes on God, if we'll put our eyes on Him, if we'll put our trust in the Lord, we shall have peace. We shall have comfort. We shall have joy unspeakable and full of glory tonight. Do you have joy down deep in your soul? Coronavirus can't take joy from you. <laughs> Do you have joy? Your joy is in the Lord. Has the Lord forsaken us? Has He left us? Is he nowhere to be found? Oh, my friend, he can be found if you will seek his face. And so we know that God has given us the victory. I'm talking about the brethren, children of God. You have victory tonight. You don't have to succumb to sin and to your flesh, to your desires and your wants. God has given us victory. Well, don't harden your hearts. This is the provocation of the day of temptation of wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Don't do that. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We must run to him. We must trust Him. We must walk with Him. He said, but exhort one another daily. Listen, let, let's help each other out. Let's exhort each other, brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, uh, church, let's, let's, let's call each other. Let's, let's send text each other. Hey, uh, let, let's, let's get connected in the way that we can right now with one another and exhort one another. Exhort one another, my dear friend. Hey, the Lord's coming one day. What glorious day. And we won't have to suffer anything else in this world again. But God's grace is more than enough in our sufferings, in our troubles, in our problems. God is the solution. There is going to be a cure. There's going to be uh, 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 the vaccines and all that that they're doing, uh, the, the drugs that will help you. This is because of a gift from God, by the grace of God, by the mercy of God. God is the answer. We must call upon Him. So we find here, He says, but exalt one another daily. While it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know what sin will do to you? You know why tonight you're hard? In your heart because you have allowed sin to take root and take over and take control of your life. That's why you have a hard heart tonight. Maybe God's trying to soften up our hearts a little bit. Maybe He's trying to get us to stop and pause for a moment. Maybe He's trying to get us to be still and know that He is God. Is your heart hard tonight? 
Don't let sin harden your heart. And if sin has hardened your heart, come to God. Brethren, listen to me. 1 John 1 and 9. If you'll confess your sins, God is faithful just to forgive you your sins. Listen, confess your sins to God. Apologize to God. Listen tonight. He'll help to restore your relationship with Him. God wants you to have a relationship with Him. If you're lost tonight, oh, I plead with you. Would you come to Jesus and be saved by the grace of God? Don't die and go to hell. There's nothing worth dying and going to hell for. People's thinking about death. Death may very well come to somebody's door that you know, that you care about, you love. God forbid it does. But it may. Listen, my dear friend, we need to know that things are settled and right between us and God. Don't harden your heart against God. Sin hardens your heart. Get the sin out of your life. Get rid of those things, child of God. Don't let it, you, don't, you are not controlled by sin anymore. If you're letting sin to control your life, it's because you're allowing sin to control your life because you're not, my dear friend, taking what God has given us and applying them to your life. Especially faith. So we find here, as we look at this, this deceitfulness of sin that's hardened hearts. We see the hardness of hearts all around the world because of sin. We pray that this very pandemic soften our hearts to God. He said, for we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke Albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? To whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? That's the ones who couldn't enter in. That's the ones who died in the wilderness. That's the ones who died in want. He says, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. This is the reasoning. I read chapter 4 here and close and we look at this last chapter. I want you to look at it with me. He said, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. We need to live a victorious Christian life. We need to live that Canaan land life. My dear friend, we can come short of it. We come short of it because of unbelief. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. In other words, they didn't believe. They didn't trust what God said. They didn't have confidence in it. And they didn't apply it. It was not obedient unto it. Are we being obedient to the word of God? Are we applying God's word to our life? Are we just hearers? Deceiving our own selves? No. We ought to be doers. He said, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And I want you to notice that. Underscore that. From all his works. You know what your problem is? You're trying to do it. That's what your problem is tonight. You're trying to do it. You're, you're not giving it to God and you're not doing it for God. You're trying to do it in the power of your own flesh. You're trying to do it through the aid of men instead of God. He tells us here, and in this place of ear, and if they shall enter into my rest, if they shall, are you going to? It's up to you. Seeing therefore it remaineth the same, must, uh, that some rather, remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited to a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, are you listening? Harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he 
not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to who? To the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his works as God did from his. As a reference to what I told you to underscore while ago in verse number four. He said, if we've entered into rest, we've ceased from our works. It's not our works. It's his works. It's his work. It's a work of righteousness. It's a work of God. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a work of the Son of God. It's a work of God. It's not your works. If you're going to do it in your power of your flesh, you're going to fail. But if you'll do it in the power of God, you'll do it in the power of faith, you'll do it, my dear friend, according to what God told us in His Word. Then you can enter in to rest. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Let's seek God. Let's knock, and it shall be open. Hey, uh, let's do these things. Let's pursue Him. Because His presence is where His rest is found. When we lean upon His bosom. He says, For the Word of God, verse 12, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank God for it. Even, it says, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrow and as a asunder of, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You want to discern your thoughts and intents of your heart? Right here. This is how you do it. The Word of God. Neither any creature that is not manifest in His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. God knows all about you. He knows everything about you. You're not hiding anything from God. Why won't you just come and rest in Him? God knows things that are between you and Him. He knows your sins. Come confess them. Come to the Lord. Draw close to Him, child of God, and if you're lost, come to Him. Confess your heart, sinner. Confess Him as your Lord and Savior. He will give you life. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Why? Because we have confidence in who's up there. Jesus Christ. He's put His blood on the mercy seat. He's there that liveth to make intercession for us. He says in verse 15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Oh, He has touched the feelings of our infirmities even in this time. But was not all points tempted like as we are yet without sin? Christ lived a sinless life. My dear friend, we pass from death into life. So we ought to follow Him and follow His example. We are not sinless. But we have trusted the sinless one. We do not have to come as children of God to sin anymore. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Boldly come. Pray. Two things that we find that Jesus gave us about overcoming temptation was the Word and prayer. We find the Word of God. He used it when Satan tempted him. And we find as well that he told his disciples to pray lest they enter into temptation. And we see these things here in this passage. Overcoming the flesh. May God help us to do so. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight once again. Pray your blessings. Have your will away. In Jesus' name, amen.